So Jude, welcome to the podcast. It is so great to have you. Rick, I am excited to be here. I've been looking forward to this ever since we met in Orlando at uh, Cabus. Yes, that's right. February. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I've been looking forward to this. And then reconnected in High Point, which is exciting. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely exciting to reconnect at High Point, um, to film with you, filming a part of Luann's, uh, Luann Nigera's docuseries. So yeah, it's definitely been a um, great relationship for me. It was kind of cool to see firsthand what it is that you do, because we have chatted a little bit, and my intention was to have you on the podcast um, and have you explain to us what it is that you do, and then seeing it firsthand really kind of like lit a fire under me and I'm like okay let's get you on pronto because we need to talk about storytelling <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and I'm, I'm glad you you invited me and in that we're making this happen um storytelling is a hot topic right now so we've got a lot to talk about it's going to be very good for the listeners before we dive into it uh let's talk about you for a second uh tell us a little bit about yourself give us a little background personally and um tell us a little bit about your business I want you to imagine you're 17 years old in high school, and of course, you're thinking about college. You're thinking about what is the next step? What do I want to do in my life? And then your teacher, TV production teacher, on May 4th, 2006, while you're 17 in the classroom, tells you you're really, really talented at video production. You should start a business. And then the following day, May 5th, 2006, she hands you your first set of business cards. Oh my gosh. That was my story. That is how I got into video production, how I'm a filmmaker 16 years later. It was because of my teacher, Mrs. Donnelly, who uh, saw something in me and was just like, I can't let this kid waste this talent. And so she went out and purchased my first set of business cards. To this day, I still have it. Um, and yeah, that's what I've been doing ever since. I helped entrepreneurs bring their stories to life through documentaries. And so we talked a little bit about that in the beginning. Luann Nigera, I'm filming her documentary series right now. And what that means is that I normally follow entrepreneurs around. I'm like a fly on the wall <laughs> and I'm seeing real life as it happens. I'm seeing them um, interacting with their community. I'm seeing them at home with whether it's their husband or wives or their children. I'm seeing who they are, not just what they do, but who they are as a leader, who they are as a person. Um, I have been doing that for 16 years, and that's what I, I love to do. It I love to bring stories to life. That's awesome. You know what? Um, much credit to that high school teacher, because when I learned a little bit about you and then met you in High Point, and I saw you filming, and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> and then you kind of shared with me what you were doing. And then you said, hey, let me ask you a couple questions. So then you asked me a couple of questions. And immediately, I was like, oh, shit, you are doing what you should be doing. Like, I, your teacher was 100% right. And I'm sure everyone that you work with has probably said the same thing. You just have this way about you, about asking a question and receiving information. Um, you know, not everybody has that. So I'm so glad that someone recognized that in you. And I'm very glad that you listened. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, you know, it wasn't easy because I'm the youngest of 10 children. So when Mrs. Donnelly said to me, hey, Jude, you should start a business. My father is a construction worker. My mom works at a chair, chair factory. And no one in my, in my uh, family had been entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so for her to not just say it to me, she said it May 4th. It was kind of like I brushed it off. I didn't tell her yes or no that I'd do it. I brushed it off. But she knew to have, she would have to give me business cards. She would have to get me started. Um, yeah, much props to her. And that's why no matter who I'm talking to, I still keep in contact with Mrs. Donnelly to this day. But no matter who I'm talking to, I always give her props because I literally would not be doing what I'm doing today if it was not for her. That story makes me think back to the people that influenced me. And I bet everyone that's listening is doing the same thing because it all starts, it all stems from some place. Um, yep. so that's a really great story. What did you yeah. do? Uh, what steps did you take to kind of grow and develop your business in order to be who and what you are today? The first five years in business, I completely failed. I 
did not know how to market myself and um, to get clients to pay me what I thought I was worth. Mm -hmm. So I struggled the first five years making $20,000 a year. But it wasn't until uh, one morning I woke up at 7 a.m. to the sounds of chains hitting the floor. It had always been a nightmare to hear these chains hitting the floor. And what it was when I got up out of bed and ran to the front window, it was a tow truck driver coming to repossess my car for the second time in eight months. I pleaded with him not to take the car. Of course, he had a job to do. I went back in, sat on the edge of my bed, and I, I sat there in a soup of anxiety for about 40 minutes. And then I get a phone call from a client. Her name is Keisha Dior. And Keisha Dior I had been working with um, to document her journey of building her business from the ground up. She was building a cosmetic business. Mm -hmm. So she was selling lipsticks online. If you think of like blue, green, purple lipstick online. And she called me to tell me she had made $1 million in her business the first year in business. Wow. Now, again, I'm in the moment where I'm thinking it's time to quit. It's time to give this all up. And she's telling me she's made a million dollars. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what am I doing wrong? Because I have been in business five years struggling. She's been in business one year. And so what I did immediately after that phone call is I started looking up workshops, filmmaking workshops, but not just to learn the craft of filmmaking, mm -hmm. to learn the business side of filmmaking. And the very first online course I took was a course called Earn 1K. And the premise behind that course was learn how to make your first $1,000. And if you learn how to make the first $1,000, you just repeat it. Well, of course, I had made $1,000 by then, but I didn't do it the right way. Uh -huh. And so I went back and learned. I took a year off. I was still working with Keisha Dior, but I didn't take on any other clients. I took a year off to learn marketing and sales. And that is really what became the turning point in my business because once I knew how to market myself, I understood what clients were really looking for. They weren't just looking for a video. They were looking to grow their business. When I understood that and I understood how to position it, I understood how to tell my own story. Because believe it or not, the story about Mrs. Donnelly, I didn't share in the beginning because I just I didn't think it was important. Right. Once I started doing all of that, that's what helped change where I am today, where I am specialized. I only do documentary series for entrepreneurs. I'm not doing promotional videos. I'm not doing um, birthday parties or weddings. I only <laughs> do documentaries for entrepreneurs. Um, but it is because of that one moment when Kish Dior called me to tell me she made $1 million selling niched lipstick. Right. Like blue, green, purple back in 2009, 2010 wasn't popular. But again, it is because of what I got to see behind the scenes with her in that moment that I'm thinking about quitting and I'm realizing, no, there's a different way to go about this. And this is why I think that you are so relatable to my listeners, because I know we can't see them and they can't see us. But if I said, raise your hand right now, if you can relate to this story, I promise you, most of them have their hand raised right now because mm -hmm. our community is filled with incredible designers, very talented, creative people who had to go back to the drawing board and get those marketing and sales um, skills refined in order to really build and and create the business that they envision for themselves. So 100% relatable in that regard. Let's talk about how this relates specifically to interior designers as far as storytelling. Because right now we're in a place where transparency, authenticity, vulnerability, those are all big buzzwords across the board in marketing especially in interior design. So many of us are out there sharing in whatever way that we can, rather it's social media or otherwise. Um, how is telling a better story? How, how, how will that help us as design professionals? Yeah, here's the main thing, and it's going to sound very simple. Um, it, telling your story or any story helps you to connect. When I told my story of my car being repossessed or the, the, the transition moment that I had in my life, you immediately was like, oh, that's so relatable, right? I own a video production company. It's in the creative field, but it's not what your audience does. It's not interior design. Mm -hmm. But it's relatable because we know what it's like to struggle. We know what it's like to reach a point where you're like, do I keep this going even though I'm not making any money? 
even though I have this big dream, do I keep this going? Storytelling. I could have easily said to you, Rick, hey, you know what? I failed my first five years in business, but I found a way to make it work. Okay, that's nice. It's a statement, but it doesn't connect anything. It doesn't help you to see or to imagine what it was like for me to be sitting on the side of my bed minutes after my car is being repossessed to try to figure out what am I going to do next. Right. Right? That's what storytelling does. It helps you to connect. It helps you to not just tell me who you are, but show me who you are beyond words. Right? And so I mentioned that I, after the Keisha Dior moment, I also started telling my own story because I wouldn't tell it. What I realized is when I started telling people how I got into the business, that Mrs. Donnelly gave me my first set of business cards, they would lean in. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, a teacher gave you business cards? And to me, again, it wasn't anything big or major. It's not like she gave me money to get the business started. (laughs) But to them, it was she believed in you so much that she got you business cards. And so that's why I started telling the story over and over. You ask, how do we know to tell the right story? How do you know, okay, you're being vulnerable, you're being transparent, you're being authentic. How do you know you're telling the right story? Yeah, like is there a structure? I mean, is are there, you know, pillars or something? Because well, everybody, you know, we all have our own methods and we all think we're doing yeah. it right or hope we're doing it right. But, you know, well, is there a structure? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Story is all about a very specific moment in time. That's what a story is. Mm-hmm. So, again, I started this by saying, hey, Rick, I could have just, just told you I got into business, failed my first five years and figured it out. That's not a story. Mm -hmm. By bringing you into the day that my car got repossessed in the moment, what I'm thinking, feeling, and seeing, that brings you into a story. But here's, here's here's the key, though. When you're telling the story and you realize people are leaning in, that's when you know it's interesting and it's fascinating. Yeah. When they ask you more questions about it, that's when you know it's interesting and fascinating. The only way, though, to know that you're telling the right story is to rehearse it and tell it. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Tell me about a moment in time. See if the person is leaning in, if they're interested. If they're not, then you know you're not telling the right story. But how do you even get to that point where you're like, how do I pick this story? You got to know who you're talking to. Right. You got to know the audience, right? So, for example, I... Uh, I talked about Luann, and I'm doing her docuseries. Well, one thing I know about Luann is that she is running a podcast, right? She's kind of quirky. I'd listened to the podcast before I'd ever been on it. She's quirky, right? She loves a good story. She loves to ask a lot of deep questions. But she also likes practicality. Mm -hmm. So when I'm telling a story, I'm not just going to tell her a story of, you know, I turned the business around and, Now it's successful. I'm going to give her the practical steps that I did. I'm going to tell her the story of Keisha Dior and what happened in that moment. But then I know I need to wrap it up with practical steps of here's part A, part B, and part C of what I did. That's how you know when you're telling the right story is you you pay attention to who you're talking to, who your audience is, Mm -hmm. whether it's one person or many. And then you tell stories that are going to connect, that are going to be relatable to that person, to the group of people that you're speaking to. Because I think for design professionals, we we know who our audience is. It's obviously consumers. It's people that we want to attract so that we could collaborate and work with them. And I think that many designers are spending a lot of time telling the story of how great of a designer they are. You know, I don't know. I just always had the flair for it. Um, I went to design school. I kicked ass. I started my own business. And well, here I am. And it's kind of like when you pick that apart and think about it, your audience already knows that. If they're talking Mm -hmm. to you, they kind of already know that. So, you know, then then that begs the question, what should we be telling? You know, so then we go back to those moments in time or those stories um, that I think... Everyone is already telling the perfect story. Yeah. Meaning, you just mentioned how, like, everybody's talking about how they're the best. Well, we look on social media, everybody's showing the the great looking picture. No (laughs) one shows behind the scenes. The very first story to think about is to tell the behind the scenes story. Right. I go back to, just because I've only told, I told the story before is why I keep going back to the story of my car getting repossessed. That has nothing to do with video production. 
on the surface, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do. But because I'm telling you about something that happened behind the scenes that helped me to keep going, this moment in time that helped me to keep going, that's one way to think about how do I tell a story that's going to connect? That's going to go beyond, hey, I'm really good at what I do, because everybody's already telling that same story. Right. Everybody's already saying, I'm the best. Okay, great, but take me into a moment in time where you weren't the best. Yeah, and how did you, you come weren't back at from that? Your best. Yeah, how did you? And come how did you come back from that? How did you climb out of it? Right. I would see or, more value in that as a yeah. consumer because you know, mm -hmm. like, like I said, everyone has always seen the glamour, already seen the glamour on Instagram. They've already seen our website. They already know that you do amazing work. But as a consumer, I feel like if I was interviewing a designer, I would almost rather hear about their worst day in design and how they overcame it, what they did to resolve that problem so that I could hear firsthand how they problem solve, uh, what solutions they're bringing to the table. And that right there kind of shows me the level of service that I can anticipate. I already know that you're an amazing designer. I already know that you're talented and I want you, but I want to know you and how you're going to handle and service me as a client. You know what I mean? Rick, I want to have some fun with this. <laughs> We've talked a little bit behind the scenes talking about breaking down your story. There's one story specifically I want to break down or the time that you've mentioned to me when we were talking, you don't know this is coming, but the one thing you said to me that really had my ears perk up is that the transition you made from being an interior designer to now being a business consultant is that you weren't living out your purpose work. You weren't doing the work that you felt like you were called to do. But there was something, there was a sentence you said, and that's the real story that I want to know about. Mm -hmm. You say you felt like a failure. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. What, what does that mean that you felt like a failure? Um, I think when I was telling you that story, I was referring to probably my interaction with clients. Um, I never really felt like a failure creatively or even on a business level um and not to bash our clients because they were wonderful people but i never felt like i was able to fulfill their needs wholly um from a creative level from a service level the whole experience and mm -hmm. this was this became a reoccurring theme for me is that um i felt like i was failing like every job ended but it didn't end with the celebration, you know what I mean? Mm, <laughs> and it doesn't yeah. mean that we didn't do a great job. I just felt like I had given it my all and the client was still like, thanks for your 85% effort. We appreciate it. You know, <laughs> let's move on now. And I didn't want, I wanted that hundred percent satisfaction. And the yeah. only way, the only other time that I felt that was when I was interacting with design professionals and we would have mm. conversations about the business of design and just design in general. And they would be long, heated conversations usually, and they would be debates. But at the end, we'd be like, oh my God, I'm so glad that we had this conversation. That was so amazing. And you know what? We didn't figure it out for God's sake, but I just feel better about this and I'm showing up tomorrow and I'm ready to kick ass. And like that felt good. That felt whole. So I want your audience to pay attention to this. Tell me one client that you felt like and you, of course, you're, we're not going to name names, but tell me <laughs> one client where you felt like you got to the end of the project and it was just like, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't quote unquote successful. Because right, successful for you would have been 100% everything was good. Yeah. Tell me about one client where that happened or one specific project. Sure, that's easy. I mean, there's a, a project in particular that, that still kind of stings to this day. It's a project that we're that we worked on for years. And, yeah. you know, quite honestly, we just gave up. We as a business mm. and me personally just kind of gave up. It was not a good fit from the beginning. We mm -hmm. lost control of the job. Mm -hmm. The client had complete control of the job and the client was basically running our business. And so mm. it was very defeating, not fulfilling at all. You said it wasn't a good fit from the beginning. How did you know that? Um, because it didn't fit the the template, if you will, that we dis mm -hmm. that we had established later. So at the time, we didn't have that template. This project did us a lot of good because it taught us a lot, 
and it prompted us to create this template so that this would not happen again. But at the time, we weren't paying very close attention to the right clients. And I, as a business person uh, on a service level, was not being very um, consistent about how we do business and the level of service that we deliver. Um, that all changed. So, you know, a not so great situation was a very good learning experience, but it was just a shitty feeling. <laughs> but here's why I want your audience to pay attention. A story is about a very specific moment in time. You still haven't brought me into that moment. You've told me statements around the day, or you've told me statements around what happened, but I want you to bring me into the moment. You're sitting I knew across you were from a client, ask that. <laughs> and you realize they're not a good fit. Um, I don't think that that was the defining moment. The good fit wasn't a defining moment. I'll tell you the moment that affected me the most. That after okay. several years of enduring this project and mm -hmm. all of the chaos associated with it, um, and designers can relate to this, you know, the pinnacle of a project is delivering that finished project and having yeah. the client show up and walk through the home and... Rather they say this is amazing or not, it's just that process of saying, this is the culmination of our work. Here mm -hmm. you are. And mm -hmm. yeah, this moment sticks with me and it stings. They didn't show up. They didn't show up. They were in a meeting and they said, you know what? Just go ahead and leave the house. We'll be home around seven o'clock tonight. We'll do a walkthrough and call you and let you know what we think. And so we left. Mm. And yeah, that, that was a, that was a moment for me. That was a moment for me. Why, what, what were you thinking in that moment when you're on the phone, you're telling the client, Hey, we're, we're at your house. We want to show you the property. And they tell you we're not, you know, we'll, we'll look at it later. Yeah. What were you thinking in that moment? I was thinking that there was really there was no value whatsoever in what I was bringing to the table. And mm. I wanted to change that. I wanted to change that. I want people to value what I bring to the table. I want people to want to work with me and to want to be a part of that process, to be engaged in it. Um, a mutual business relationship as opposed to a one-sided and you know, I don't know. Was I shooting for the stars? I don't think so because I have it now. But it took a, it yeah. took some major change. Tell me about. Walk me through. Paint the picture for me. What did you do? Did you drive to the client's house before you even called? Like, tell me. Walk me through the day of what happened. It's like therapy, Jude. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't told very many people this it story is. before, but I'm kind of glad that we're yeah. talking about it because you know, going yep. back to what we yep. said at the be beginning of this conversation. We talk about a lot of the fluff and we don't talk a lot about the rest. Um, mm -hmm. But this was, you know, it was definitely like a week long installation and, and okay. it was not local. It was a drive. So it was a real commitment going back and forth um, to pull the whole thing off. How long was the drive? Oh, it was an hour and a half drive, maybe two hours in traffic. Hour and a half drive. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it was a commitment. And, you know, the day that we presented the house, that was the last day of the installation. And so really that day we just showed up to kind of fluff. That's when we made things pretty and put out flowers and made sure everything looked beautiful and clean and, and, you know, put the photos on the nightstands and all that good stuff. That's how we did it. And so it was a, it was probably now that I think about it, the best day, it started out as the best day of the whole process because we were finally finished and we were actually excited to share, um, mm -hmm. the culmination mm -hmm. of our work. Um, you know, but that all kind of ended poorly. <laughs> yeah okay but here, here's the thing here's the thing so you're getting somewhere though i asked you how long was the drive because you're paying that picture for me right like it's an hour and a half yeah. drive then you started off saying then you said in which i was i was hoping you would finish the rest of it you said it started off as being the best day ever because you were finally getting ready to finish yeah. it but here's the mistake you made in telling that story you started off with saying oh yeah it was the best day ever but then you said, oh, but then it ended as the worst day ever. You didn't take me through the middle of that. <laughs> what happened in the middle of that, right? So, again, let's, let's start it off again. Because, again, I want your audience to 
be able to understand how to do this from this for themselves, to be able to bring a story to life, to be able to tell me the story that's happening. Right. And we we are. I'm going to show you, Rick, how this is not just going to benefit you. Okay, we're talking about it on the podcast here. This is going to benefit you because you work with other interior designers. Right. 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 And you're going to be able to relate to other interior designers. So start the story again. You're getting. Tell me about the. T- what time was it that you left your office? Was it you and your team? Like, yeah. Tell me about what you're thinking through this hour and a half drive because it's it started off. This day started off as the best day ever. Like, I really want you to start with that line. This day well, I started say, off as the best day ever. I wouldn't day. say that it was the best day ever, but it was the best day associated with that project because okay, it was so the this, culmination this of everything. This day started off. And, and you yeah, make this a good day point. Started off, You're right, because yeah. I think if I was encouraging a design client to tell that same story to a consumer to, sh- to help them learn more about them, if they finish the story there, then the consumer really learned nothing about them. So the part that I exactly. didn't tell you, to your point, is that, yeah, it was an early morning. It was like the f- fourth or fifth morning of leaving at 630 in the morning to get to the house on time. And, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, my associates came and it was, uh, these are all hands on deck moments. So that day of presentation, everyone shows up um, because everybody at some point touches every project, whether you drew it or you purchased for it or you installed it. Everybody works and touches on that project. So it's an opportunity for all of them to be a part of that final day. And it is. It's a good experience. It's like a team building moment. We're out of the office. We're running around this beautiful house. I mean, just because the experience wasn't great doesn't mean that the house wasn't amazing. And we were able to see all of these crazy designs that we developed over the course of the three and a half years. And it's like, oh, remember, it started out like this. And then it turned into this. And then they changed it midway. But now look at how amazing it is you know, kind of thing. So it's a, it's a real show and tell kind of day. So it's just, it's a good feeling to see, um, you know, what we've created, you know, creatively and what we're delivering on a service level. Yeah. And so you get there that day, you're thinking about all of this, the hour, you have an hour and a half to think about the culmination of this project, that it's still, you may have had hiccups, but it was still a beautiful project. Right. You drive into the what? What happens next? Tell me what happens. Do you drive into the driveway and make the phone call? Like, hey, we're here. What happens? Yeah, well, the phone call comes later in the day. So, like I said, you know, most uh, the first half of the day is spent us really just kind of fine tuning everything and walking through the house, and that's when you kind of pretend like you live there almost. And you walk to the house, and you do you envision what it's like to walk the client to the house and share with them, mm-hmm. you know, those moments. It's it's kind of what you see on TV times ten because you're experiencing it in real life. So it's an exciting experience. Um, you know, and then, and then you wait. (laughs) So we did that whole process and we had lunch, you know, we went to the subway in the corner, you know, and we had, you know, we got a sandwich and we sat in the driveway and we ate our lunch because everybody thinks that, you know, our world is so glamorous and that we went somewhere beautiful for lunch and then came back. And that's not the case at all. We spend most of our time eating our lunch in the car. And so this was no, today was no different. And, um, you know, and then we waited. And, and we did. We made the call and said, hey, OK, you know, it's about two o'clock and we're ready to rock and roll. So we're hoping that you can come down here and have a look and walk through the place. We're excited to share it with you and, and be done with this. <laughs> and, you know, and it just it didn't pan out. And I know that we've already kind of covered that. But the day itself, there was a lot of good things about that day, um, you know, seeing the outcome of our hard work. Um, just because the story didn't end the way I would like it to, there is a lot of, there's a lot of meat in this story. There was a lot of satisfaction. And, you know, like I said, the culmination of hard work is, was rewarding. How do you deliver the news to your team that the clients aren't going to show up? Like what do the, what does your team feel and think about that? Well, that turned into a situation where we were like, Hey, sounds like they're going to be late. So if you guys don't want to stick around, go ahead and head out. Traffic's going to be a nightmare. We don't need really all of us to do this. But obviously, if you want to stay and be a part of this, we welcome it. And so people start mm-hmm. trickling off, you know, one by one. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it just leaves to kind of me and the lead designer, the principal designer. And we always, you know, we were inseparable. So we stuck it out together. And, you know, not to go negative on the story, but that's kind of when we just 
that awkward moment when you're sitting there looking at each other like, is this really happening? Maybe they are coming. Maybe just one of them will come. Maybe just one will show up. It's okay. If we can walk her through, all the better. He's been involved all along. Or maybe he shows up and she doesn't. It's okay. She can have her moment when she arrives later this evening. And then, you know, that awkwardness continues and it culminates. And then it turns into frustration. And then it just becomes disappointment. And so we pack it up, <laughs> hop in the car, sit through traffic, because at this point it's rush hour. And, um, you know, it is what it is. Let's jump ahead to the kind of interior designers you work with today, yep. the coaches, the, the clients that you're coaching. You said um, you didn't feel like you were fulfilling your clients' hopes. Mm -hmm. You weren't going 100% when you were doing the interior design work. But when you talk with interior designers, when you're interacting with them and then you're helping them solve problems, like that brings you life. Yeah. Tell me about one client that you've had that brought you life, that made you realize, oh, I'm right where I need to be. Oh, that's a good question. And you know what? Someone comes to mind immediately. It was actually an unexpected client, someone that I didn't expect to work with because when I launched this business, I figured that I would rely on uh, local design professionals, people that I knew, my circle of trust, that sort of thing. And my goal is obviously to grow it. Um, but strangely enough, right off the bat, I connected with an out-of-state client. And so, mm. you know, she kind of tested my ability to, to consult uh, with her on her challenge because we had to do it remotely. And, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't even know her. I didn't know anything about her. And it was pretty exciting, actually, because she was running a design business and she was also running a retail space. And okay. she was trying to determine how to merge the two together because they were do both doing very well. And um, so we spent a lot of time strategizing how to achieve that. We created some roadmaps, you know, we did what we do. And the interesting thing is the outcome of that client was the complete opposite of what we expected. And so, you know, kind of long story short, she decided to eliminate the business of design entirely and focus on the retail for a whole bunch of reasons, financially, personally, and otherwise. And both of us were like, this is not what we were expecting to happen. You know, I didn't think this is what you called me to achieve. And she's like, I didn't think this is what I called you to achieve either. But through our conversations and through the work that we've done, it has helped me realize that this is the best thing to do. And mm -hmm. I mean, we were kind of giddy about it because it really kind of reinforced the value of having those conversations and exploring and thinking out loud with someone and, and being challenged so that you can ultimately make the best decision for you and your business. So, and that was, mm. that was extremely fulfilling to me. You ever been to Spokane, Washington? I have not been to Spokane. So I went to Spokane, Washington in um, July of 2014. Uh -huh. I went to a leadership conference. And I was very excited because I always knew leadership was important to me. It was a part of my purpose. Yeah. And I live in Florida, Pompano Beach, Florida. Spokane, Washington is in the state of Washington, northwest part of, the, of America. But Spokane was so beautiful to me because in, in Pompano Beach, Florida, it's very diverse. A lot of culture. Uh -huh. A lot of people, a lot of culture different from different places. Spokane, Washington is the same. But then I realized Washington State is the furthest northwest point. Florida is the furthest southeast point of America. What if I took a Greyhound bus home? Oh, my. Yeah, it was the worst decision. <laughs> um, it was a three-day trip, and by the time I got to Chicago, Illinois, I was miserable. There's just weird people that get on a Greyhound, and I just did not know what I had signed up for. But I had my phone off the entire time. I turn back on my phone, and I get a text message from my sister, and the text message says, call me back, it's urgent. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned this is July 2014. At this point in my life, my mother uh, was going through depression. It had 
attempted suicide. My father was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So I braced myself when I got that text from my sister because I knew it was either mom or dad. Sure. I call back my sister. Ends up being dad, unfortunately. They found him unresponsive in the house. So I get on the first flight back home the next morning from Chicago, Illinois, to uh, Pomp- uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So I'm out of one misery, but I'm coming back home into another one. My brother comes to pick me up. He comes with his daughter, my niece, Ayana. I hug my brother. I don't say a word. We don't say a word to each other. I hug my niece. We don't say a word. But I sit in the back seat with my niece, Ayana. And I'm staring off in space because in 2014, I'm 25 years old, and I never imagined that my father would not see me get married or my father would not see me have children. Mm. I'm the youngest. I'm the baby. And as we're driving, Ayana looks at me. She says, Uncle... Why did grandpa have to die? And I just stared at her and she said it again. Why did grandpa have to die? I look back outside the window. We get home. We make preparations. Within a week, we are burying my father. Well, on August 9th, 2014, at the funeral, I, Jude Charles, the youngest of 10 children, end up giving my father's eulogy. Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment that I realized my life's purpose wasn't just leadership. It was to actually lead. I had always hidden from the idea of leading because, to me, leading was like the person that was the president or, or the pastor of the church. I didn't want to be the center of attention. But when I, when I was preparing my father's eulogy and I looked up the word lead, L-E-A-D, I looked it up in the dictionary and it says, to guide a group of people along a journey or a path. Mm-hmm. That's it. Doesn't mean you're the center of attention. Doesn't mean you're the person at the top. It's just you're a person that's there to guide. Fast forward uh, six years, 2020, I go through burnout. And every year since 2013, I've taken two months off. I'm in a cabin. I'm thinking about what I do next. And I come up with my mission. It's very clear today. Mm -hmm. My mission is to lead and empower other entrepreneurs to have relentless courage. So I tell you that story because that is how I relate. When I'm talking to my clients, I do this thing called a road mapping session. Before we even get started, Mm -hmm. I tell my client, hey, we're going to go through this full day strategy session. I tell them the story of what happened that day that I had to bury my dad and I, I figure out leadership is important and all these things, right? And then I say, I'm not here to tell you how to do video. I'm not even here to, to help you tell your story. I'm here to lead you through this process. Right. Because it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. But we're going to get through it the same way I got through giving my dad's eulogy. I went this roundabout way to tell you that, that exaggerated story because you ended your story with this client who stayed in retail. Instead of doing design and retail, she stayed in retail. But you said something at the end that I was like, oh, that's beautiful. You said, you helped her make the best decision. It's not what you were expecting but you helped her make the best decision for herself. As a business coach, business consultant, you are going to step outside the formulas that you have Mm -hmm. to help your clients make the best decision the same way you had to when you walked away from interior design. You realize it wasn't fulfilling. Now you stepped into helping other interior designers. But the way to tell that story is to tell them about that day that the client didn't come to the final big showing. This is, this is what makes this moment worth it. Yeah. Even with the headaches, with the changes, it's the client coming in, walking through the property, and saying, oh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Like, just appreciation. Right. Right? You made the best decision for yourself by walking away from that business in order to actually help people that you really feel fulfilled to help, and you help them make the best decision because you know what it's like. Yep. Yep. I want to help. So I just want to make sure, like, I I went around that roundabout way to go to tell my own story because I want, here's what I want the audience to take away. When you're telling a story, you're telling me about a very specific moment in time, what you tell me at the end, the lesson that you learned from that moment in time Mm -hmm. is what makes everything else worth it. Right. Right. That's interesting. I've never, 
I've never told that story that way. And now I'm thinking about it a lot more, even as we're talking, I'm, it, it's kind of running through my mind again. And I'm like, hmm, what else did, it, did it, this experience, you know, how else did it impact me? And what other similar situations or stories like that in my life had an impact on me? And what has mm -hmm. that all led to? So it's, yes. it, I appreciate you doing this because, and hopefully everyone that's listening is doing the same kind of thing. Because my question to you before we started recording was, how do I know if I'm telling the right story? <laughs> and I think I even said that yeah. at the beginning of our conversation. I got lots of stories. And yeah. I mean, you just in a few minutes were very helpful at kind of extracting a story that, and you know, like I said, I've got tons of them. But right away, you were able to extract a story that's pretty significant and that was very telling. And I mean, it told you a little bit about me and helped you understand yep. a little bit about me in just a few short minutes. Yep. yep. And it helps me understand if I were an interior designer looking for a business coach, it helps me understand whether or not you're the right choice. Mm -hmm. As an entrepreneur, as a leader, as an executive, you don't want to convince people that you're right. You want to help them get to that realization on their own. <laughs> <laughs> that was my biggest challenge. That was one of the things that bothered me the most is that in design, I felt like I was convincing them and sell. It's not your I, job. Like, there's a difference between selling and convincing. I'll sell you beautiful things all day long, but I don't want to have mm -hmm. to convince you. If I have to convince you to do something, you don't really yeah. want to do it. And all of a yeah. sudden, this isn't great anymore. You know? Yeah. That's where buyer's remorse comes in, right? Like we've heard the term before, you go to buy something at a store and then you get home and you're like, oh, why did I even buy this? Right. Right? It's buyer's remorse. You don't even, here, I would actually say it differently what you, than what you said. I wouldn't even say you're selling them. I would say you're going from convincing someone to leading them. Your clients aren't paying you. As an interior designer. Even better. As an interior designer, your clients aren't paying you to just make their house look pretty. They're paying you to lead them through the process. Correct. And if you lead them through the process from the very beginning, from helping them make the right choice and helping them to see that you and them are a good fit for each other, then they'll trust you through the rest of the process. And that's what all of this is about is trust at the end of the day. So listen, designers out there, <laughs> if you're looking for an angle, talk about leadership. That's such a great example of explaining to the clients what you are really there for. I'm here to lead you through this process. And you know what? I'm going to tell you a story. And it's not going to have anything to do with design, but it's going to have to do with leadership. And I'm going to share with yep. you and show you that I am a talented and, and leader and that I can guide you through mm -hmm. this process. Yeah. Yeah. And when, you know, honestly, when you're looking for a way to stand mm -hmm. out, I believe there are 70,000 interior designers in America alone, I think it is. When you're looking for a way to stand out, the one thing that no one else can duplicate is your story. For sure. They can try to duplicate your style. They can even say they're the best. But when you tell a client a story, that story sticks with them. Yep. That's what they remember. And then you become the only option for them to work with. It's not just... Oh, I'm, I'm thinking of a few different people. I'm taking bids. I'm taking proposals. You become the only option mm -hmm. because now they're connected to you in a different way. They're not connected to you because they need an interior designer. No, they're connected to you because they need someone to lead them through the process. Right. It's two different positions. Right? This is so valuable on so many levels because like I said at the beginning of our conversation, design professionals are spinning their wheels every day developing content, trying to tell stories, trying to be vulnerable. And I think that, so, so, so break it down for us. Let's go backwards. Now, what you just yep. did, there was a structure to that. There were, yes. you've got three pillars, if you will. Yep. And I'm glad that we did this first, because now I think if you define those three pillars, we can use what we just did as examples as to how we achieved that. And absolutely. Yeah. So the three pillars are dramatic clarity, Dramatic demonstration and then dramatic leverage. I'll break down each one. So dramatic clarity, you want to get really clear on who you are and what you're about. When Rick asks the question, how do I know to tell the right story? This is where you're outlining your core values. So your core values can, I'll tell you my four or five core values. 
They are storytelling, obviously, depth versus width. That means I only work with five clients a year. Um, I like to go really, really deep with my clients. As you can tell, even on this podcast, I'm going really, really deep. It's not just a Q&A. It's not just a, you know, I'm going through a live illustration of what it is to tell your story. So the second one is depth versus width. Um, relentless. I believe in being relentless. I don't take no for an answer. Um, adventure. I do things like skydiving and zip lining. I like to go on adventures. Um, and then there's a fifth one that I can't remember now. Storytelling, depth versus width, relentless. Oh, freedom, the most important mm. one. I believe in the four freedoms, which are financial freedom, time freedom, location freedom, and client freedom. Mm. But this is why I got into this business. I just wanted to be free from and do what I want to do and have a choice. Those are my five. Because I know that and I want, to, I want my clients to know that and I want us to feel connected to each other, I find stories around those five core values. So that's dramatic clarity. Yeah. Dramatic demonstration is bringing those stories to life. So it's, it's telling me the story, but also showing me the story. I go through, um, when I'm speaking on stage, I do this uh, Jenga presentation where I tell people, you want to subtract the noise and you want to sharpen your perspective. But when we talk about subtracting in the noise, if you've played Jenga, a lot of people have, you take the pieces away and you put it back on top of you, but you make sure it doesn't topple over. My illustration is you take the pieces away, you never put them back on, but the structure still holds up. I do that live illustration. I tell the story about me going through burnout. I do that live illustration in person, but that's how you bring the story to life. There's an object that you use, or there's a video that you show. There's mm -hmm. this visual element. You don't just tell me the story, you show me the story. If you can't do a visual element, bring me into the very specific things that happened like you driving down, I believe in California it's I-4, right? Or I-10? I-10. You're driving down I-10 to go to the client's house, right? Yep. There's major traffic. You pull up to the client's blue home. It's a beautiful three-story home with 10 rooms. Like, you bring me into the specifics. So that's dramatic demonstration. Yeah. The most important piece is dramatic leverage. You use it over and over and over and over and over again. It doesn't matter if you're on a podcast. It doesn't matter if you're speaking one-on-one -on -one with a client. It doesn't matter if you're on stage. You use the story over and over because the story is not just what you're using in your business. It's who you are. You use it internally when you're talking to your team, and you want your team to understand how they can make decisions. You tell them the story. Right. Because it's not just what to do, but why to do it. The story tells them why. That gives you dramatic leverage. Um, that's the entire process. Like I think through the entire thing. What do I want this person to walk away with? How am I going to be, how am I going to be able to help them see? Remember, this is not about you. Right. It's about helping them see for themselves. Hearing something said 1,000 times is not as powerful as seeing it once. Yeah. And when they true. see it for themselves, when they see it for themselves, it becomes fact. It's no longer opinion. Right. Hence the video component. But it's funny what you just started, <laughs> when you were talking about dramatic leverage, I just wrote down because I'm thinking to myself, okay, I need to tell this story again. And every time I yep. tell it, I'm going to refine it and I'm going to yep. dig a little deeper um, to check those boxes. And like you said, the, the conclusion of that story, and I just wrote it down, they didn't show up. I'll show up for you. There you go. That's, there you that's go. the so point that's of beautiful. that story. That's the point of the story. And the point can always change. That's why I say what you do at the end, I mentioned it earlier, what you do at the end of the story, the lesson that you learn is what the person is left with. Yep. Yep. I'll show up. I'll show up. Love that. Before, the one I wrote down that I, I, I felt like I understood from you telling me the story is you're, you're going to help me make the best decision. Mm -hmm. But I'll show up for you. That's, that, what if this person that you're sitting across, the, the client, believes that people don't show up for them? Right. Yeah. And, de and, and demonstrating now, that I understand that, yep. that I've experienced yep. that, and that I won't do that. That's important. Instead of you just saying, hey, I'll show up for you, you go through the story. Yeah. You talk through what you were feeling. And that's why I asked you when, I, when you talked about 
the client, realizing the client wasn't um, going to show up. Like, that's why I had you slow down. Tell me, what was that feel? What did that feel like? You were like this awkward moment of <laughs> waiting. Because right? it like, felt shitty. <laughs> exactly. But there's a story there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's a story there. It turned into frustration and disappointment, right? You're not just telling, at that point, you're not just telling me, hey, I'm going to show up for you, Rick. Or I'm going to, you're not, Rick is not just telling me, hey, I'm going to show up for you, Jude. You walk me through the story, and now I, I get to see for myself that you understand. Right, right. So important. See? So important. I've never had this kind of conversation with anyone. No one has, and, and it seems so simple. Let's talk about storytelling. <laughs> uh, that seems pretty simple. Yeah. Let's talk about something else. So valuable. So incredibly yeah. valuable. Um, yep. You know? And I hope that everyone that's listening is is now, you know, it's percolating. They're they're percolating in their mind different examples and and better ways. They're probably already storytelling now, but hopefully after hearing this example, not my story, but how you're explaining it <laughs> and the value yeah, of it, yeah. um, it is prompting them to refine those stories and make them more effective for their business yes. and in their process, yes. be it a sales process or a marketing process or whatever that is. Yeah, absolutely. It is. We're recording this in 2022. You no longer have the option whether or not you tell stories. Yeah. It is imperative to tell stories because there's just so much noise out there. And the only way to filter through that noise, the only way for you as an interior designer to succeed and filter through the noise is to work on telling stories. It will help you internally. It will help you externally. It will help you continue to grow because the, the other thing sometimes I talk about is sometimes the most important story you're telling is the one you're telling yourself. Mm. Right. The only way to tell yourself a different story is to rewrite that story. We won't go there with me. That costs extra. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to your point, yes, yeah, storytelling is important. And what I, I think we did it today. What I hoped is that we could go really deep on understanding how storytelling can help transform your business. It's not just, oh, tell a story so you can make more money. It's to help you transform your business. I look at transformation in this way. It's not just life before and life after, but it's life long after. Right, right. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that is the way that I tell stories. That is the way I bring stories to life. And um, yeah, thank you for taking the time to really to allow me to use you Are as you a kidding guinea pig. Me? Thank you for taking the time to share. And what I hope yeah. is I hope that I hope that you'll come back on the podcast um, because I am challenging myself right now publicly to do some homework, to dig a little deeper, to yes. start telling stories that matter and that have an impact on my business and that have an impact on my clients and. In doing so, I'd love to chat with you again and just kind of share how that has benefited my business, what I've learned along the way, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, you and I would I'd probably talk I'm, offline about yeah. it, but the beauty of this podcast yeah. is I like bringing those offline conversations online so that people can truly benefit from them. So, I'd, I'd love to come back. And I think what, what's more beautiful about that is you're leading by example. Yeah. You're not just telling your audience to go out and do it. You're going to do it and hold yourself accountable by having me back on. So, yes, I would definitely come back and we could talk about that and, and see where it goes. That's great. Well, before we wrap up, how can we learn more about you? Where can the listeners go? You have a website. What is the way that what is the method that you use to share uh, the most information? Yeah, about absolutely. You? So I have a newsletter called the Dramatic Leverage Newsletter. And it talks about the business side of storytelling. So similar to what I did with Rick today, where I talked not just about the story that he could craft, but how he could leverage the story and what people can gain from the story. I write that newsletter. Um, the best place to get there is jewcharles.co forward slash newsletter. And uh, yeah, I go really deep on talking about this topic. I have been studying storytelling for the last 20 years. And We'll continue to study storytelling, but that's how I break down all the elements of storytelling and, and how to use it to go to the next level. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to put that link in the show notes so that everyone can just click right on it.
after listening to this episode and sign up for that newsletter. And I will be signing up today myself. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Rick, for having Thanks, me. Thanks, Jude, for being here. I appreciate it. Well, thank you guys for hanging in there to the very end. I realize this episode went longer than most, but there was just no way I could edit out one second of what Jude was sharing. And to break this conversation up into two episodes, well, that would just be wrong. So hopefully you all have a better perspective on storytelling, a new perspective on storytelling, and the impact that it can have on your business. Jude's process of creating your story through dramatic clarity, dramatic demonstration, and dramatic leverage is simple, repeatable, and effective. You know, I learned something about myself during this conversation with Jude. I'm a little cagey when it comes to telling stories. He really had to pry the information out of me. I mean, you guys heard. When I listened back, I was surprised at how vague I was being about the emotional details. And I'm so glad that through this exercise, Jude showed me the value of digging deep into details that can help me relay and support my messaging. I've got some homework to do, and so do you. We'll be inviting Jude back to the podcast soon for an update on my progress and the impact that this conversation had on me. Want to share how the episode impacted you? Drop us an email, and we'll make you a part of our follow-up episode. Be sure to check out Jude's website, judecharles.co, not .com, .co, for more stories about how his approach to storytelling has helped entrepreneurs transform their business. Thank you guys for listening. And until next time, be safe, be kind, and get out there and inspire.